This is uh, one of the worst weeks of the war um, for Bansted. We lost someone on Saturday, someone on Sunday, uh, someone on Monday, whose story we've yet to tell, and two men today. The war of movement had been restored on the Western Front. It issued in a, a new uh, and deadlier era for our men. Um, they were making repeated attacks every two or three days. They might find themselves in action. Each battalion would lose something like 10 to 20 percent of its strength um, in each of those attacks. Uh, and it became inevitable that the men fighting in this latter stage of the war would have a very high casualty rate, a very high chance of being uh, either mortally wounded or killed in action. The Germans had, uh, had instituted a democratic government. They'd um, opened negotiations with the Americans. Uh, and they were ret retreating now from massive holes that had been breached um, in the Hindenburg line uh, defences. The war was inevitably going to be uh, lost by them, but they were continuing, uh, continuing to fight to the last. Our stories today will not take us to the Western Front. They'll take us to, to other areas that we don't discuss uh, particularly often. Percy Blunt, the first of, of these two men, was born in September of 1890 in Goudhurst in Kent. It's on the Kent and Sussex border near Wadhurst, Wadhurst and Ticehurst. There had been something of a, a building boom in that area, lots of stately homes um, being built. And once the various different bricklayers and builders and tradesmen that were involved in, in making those houses had finished working there, they all seemed to have come up to Banstead. There was a building boom up by the Brighton Road that lasted for a quarter of a century, 400 houses um, being built, practically a new village separated uh, from the main town um, by the Garrett's Hall estate, which wasn't developed until in, into the 1930s. And Percy's father was one of these bricklayers, and he brought his family um, to Banstead in the middle of the 1890s. They lived in Diceland Road, um, at what was then number 19, um, Clifton Cottages, which is now number 18, Dyson Road. One of the very first houses um, to have been built in the road and next door to the builder's yard where most of the materials that were used in building those houses um, were kept. Um, they had a dozen children. Uh, Percy was one of the youngest and all of the family, including the grown-up children, lived together in a three-bedroom house in Dyson Road, which seems almost unthinkable now but was very, very normal in Pansted um, in those days. Um, a few years later, they moved around the corner to what's now number 36 in Ferndale Road, which was then called Darfield. Um, Percy's older brothers and, and sisters, um, most of them stayed local, moving out into other houses in that area. Um, but Percy stayed living with his parents and was still living with them uh, when war broke out. Um, he attended school um, in the village and um, he played cricket for Banstead's second 11. His family were very involved in the local football team uh, and the local cricket team. Um, his brothers, Harry and George, uh, being particularly well thought of for their cricket skills. Uh, sadly, we don't have any records of uh, Percy's, uh, Percy's innings for the cricket club, but he is commemorated on their Roll of Honour board. Um, Percy joined the army either in the autumn of 1915 uh, when the Derby scheme was in place, this, uh, this scheme where a canvasser would come and visit your home and try and persuade you to join the army either <coughs> on the spot. Uh, you had the option of deferring your entry into the army until seven, some months later when conscription came in. Uh, and you also got the choice of choosing which regiment you joined. So this made it a very uh, attractive option for those men, particularly those family men with resp responsibilities who hadn't joined up and didn't want the stigma of being conscripted, which everyone knew was inevitably going to come in uh, very soon. Um, March 1916, conscription came in for single men. Percy, who was single at the time, um, would have been conscripted if he hadn't already enlisted in the Derby scheme. It would have made no difference to his call up date. Um, he would have joined the army at the same time. He was posted initially to the reserve. Most of our men would be called up in March um, and then they would very shortly be with their units. But Percy stayed at home uh, for quite a while into the autumn of 1916. And the reason for this is very probably that he wasn't quite medically fit. He was probably a B-class man, which meant that he wasn't uh, uh, good enough to fight in the trenches, but he could be used on lines of communication or garrisoning a, a fortress in a particularly quiet um, part, of the, uh, part of the world. He would have maybe a, a slight defect with his eyesight or his hearing, maybe a problem with his teeth, something like that. He would have been capable of either walking or marching for five miles, carrying most or all of, um, of, all of the equipment. He would have been able to... Um, hear well enough that someone speaking quite close to him uh, would be heard, but he might not have been able to hear shouted orders, perhaps, um, on a battlefield. Uh, his eyesight might have been good enough for normal work, uh, 
you know, working in a depot or something like that, but not good enough uh, to shoot at an enemy um, a long way away. So it was that he remained on the home front. Um, he was with the Army Service Corps uh, on the supply side. Um, there were several branches to the Army Service Corps. Uh, and the supply side were responsible for providing all the, if you like, the non-combat stores uh, for the army. So they were responsible for providing food uh, and water uh, and other equipment like that, rather than ammunition, uh, rifles and what have you. Uh, and so it was, he was based in, in a depot here in the UK. Uh, he re remained here in, on the home front until 1918, I think. Um, he married um, in December of 1916 uh, to a lady called Edith uh, Fairweather. Uh, and she seems to have made her home in Wallington. Um, Percy probably never lived there with her, but he would have been able to visit her when he came home, uh, when he left his depot on leave. The German um, attacks of March 1918, where they drove British Fifth Army back 30 miles in less than a fortnight, um, caused a um, high number of casualties. And so all the home service units uh, were scoured for available men. And we've commemorated several men uh, this summer who were either medically unfit uh, until all cured by the magic stroke of a medical officer's pen when they needed men um, or were very young. The, the uh, threshold for, for serving overseas was 19 but that was lowered to 18 and a half um, in the wake of these German offensives. And so we see a lot of men that go overseas in the spring of 1918 uh, that end up dying in the summer and the autumn of 1918. But this didn't quite happen to Percy. He didn't go overseas to the Western Front um, his destination was elsewhere. He was sent to the Near East and the Middle East, sent to Egypt first, and then into Palestine. We'd fought a, a very successful campaign um, in Palestine. We'd crossed the Sinai Desert uh, in 1917. Um, after three attempts, we managed to take the town of Gaza. Um, we had uh, punched a great big hole through the Turkish defences, uh, and we had gone on to capture um, Jerusalem. After that, the winter rainy season had arrived, uh, nothing could be done, no one could, no one could move. Um, the cavalry were absolutely exhausted. They, they suffered uh, very high casualties in these, in these um, high-speed pursuits um, behind uh, chasing the Turks back to their second lines of defences. And so we were going nowhere for some months. And it was in this lull uh, in the fighting that plans were developed for an offensive uh, of the coming year. Now, unfortunately, that was delayed when the German offensive was launched in the spring of 1918. There were simply not enough men. Any uh, Palestine suddenly became a very low priority. Uh, many men were shipped back from there uh, to fight in the Western Front, only later uh, replaced by Indian soldiers, veteran cavalry from the Western Front, not being many opportunities to use cavalry, uh, who came out to the desert, and also very inexperienced raw recruits um, direct from India who'd never been had never seen the Western Front before, that started dribbling in small groups um, into Palestine throughout the spring and the summer of 1918. Now, one of the effects of this German offensive, as I said earlier, was to scour the home service units for men that could be sent to France, but they also scoured the Palestinian uh, units of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. Uh, and so all the medically class A men uh, were sent off to the Western Front, and their replacements, medically class B men like Percy, had to come out um, from, uh, come out from England. So it was that he shipped out uh, and arrived there probably in April 1918, uh, a group of slightly more than a dozen supply side men that uh, ended up joining a horse transport company. The army was heavily reliant on horse transport, uh, horse transport even at that late stage um, of the war. Um, and their job was to provide a supply column um, for a division of cavalry. So the cavalry would be wherever they were in the field, and they'd have a, a brigade refilling point, um, which the men of this horse transport company, the 1002nd Horse Transport, would have to deliver to. They'd go and collect um, supplies from uh, a divisional depot, uh, and they'd drive their horse and, horses and mules and even camels uh, and general service wagons um, 10 or 15 miles, maybe 20 miles um, across Palestine, uh, to deliver to these brigade refilling points, taking them their rations and the forage that the horses um, needed, uh, drinking water, uh, all kinds of, all manner of things, really. Uh, and it was this, these horse transport companies mostly consisted of drivers, both British and Indian, um, but there are also a small details of supply men, uh, like Percy, who probably would have worked uh, in, at the depot end, um, at the divisional depot. So it was that Percy probably spent most of the war uh, safely out of harm's way, um, maybe 15, 20 miles um, behind um, where the fighting was. 
Now, in the summer of 1918, um, it became, Palestine, uh, there was an opportunity seen to, to, to launch this, this campaign in Palestine. Turkish morale was plummeting. Uh, they were looking elsewhere. Because of the Russian surrender, they were transferring troops into Georgia and trying to steal um, territory up there. In order to feed them, they were starving their troops in Palestine. So the Turkish troops were very unhappy. Uh, they were running out of ammunition, uh, they had no food, they were starving, their horses were dying. Um, they had hardly any barbed wire uh, to protect their trenches, uh, and they knew that their position was probably hopeless. Um, the British general in charge, Allenby, um, had a very successful war uh, in the Middle East. Uh, he managed to convince the Turks that his grand offensive was going to hit somewhere uh, completely different to where the main blow uh, was going to fall. He mounted it in a very extensive deception operation. Um, so, it, for example, troops were allowed to move towards the area that he wanted to uh, uh, convince the Turks he was going to attack. They were allowed to move towards it at day, but then at night they'd be withdrawn uh, back, and then the next day they'd march out again, and then at night they'd be, uh, they'd be moved back. So it seemed that there were all kinds of, all numbers of uh, troops building up in this particular area. Uh, the same with guns. Um, small numbers of men uh, were very active, uh, creating the pressure of much larger bodies of men. Um, horses would be um, dragging harrows along the roads to create huge dust clouds to make it look like an army was on the march. Um, all this sort of stuff. Canvas horses were erected in fields so Turkish aeroplanes could see these great big herds of horses grazing for the cavalry. All these sorts of things. It was very successfully done and when that um, offensive began in the middle of September 1918, uh, the Turks had absolutely no clue uh, that it was going to hit on the coast um, of Palestine rather than on the banks of the River Jordan. Um, Percy and his, his units uh, were all over, all over the uh, Palestinian front. Um, they, they were supporting initially the Yeomanry Mounted Division, uh, and then 4th Cavalry uh, Division, was a, which was a mixed British and Indian um, unit. Um, they spent uh, quite a lot of time in the Jordan Valley, which was uh, an extremely unhealthy place to be. Um, it was baking hot, uh, it was extremely humid, there were an awful lot of swamps. In fact, it was the ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes, and malaria became the most common hazard uh, on that particular stretch um, of the front. Percy was probably lucky enough to be um, in a depot, uh, but many of his comrades weren't quite so fortunate. The men would alternate periods down in the, in, in the valley uh, with period up, periods up on high ground where it was much, much cooler uh, to recover. There were lots of precautions taken against uh, mosquitoes. Um, so if you were in the trenches near a swamp, you'd have repellent paste to smear all over yourself. You'd be issued with uh, an absolutely useless one square yard of, of netting, which you wouldn't be able to do very much with, except maybe blow your nose in it or something like that. Um, and as the war progressed, we started to issue veils and gloves uh, for our men just to cover up all their exposed skin, which, which proved to be very effective, but by, but by, by no means a standard issue. By far the most common uh, method to, to prevent mosquitoes was to um, locate the pools of stagnant and, um, and standing water where they bred uh, and um, pour, pour oil into them, just kerosene. Um, and that killed off their larvae. It, it meant they, uh, it smothered them. <coughs> the only trouble is that made the water taste not particularly nice. Um, there, were very more, there were more expensive and less flammable and less pungent alternatives, but kerosene was by far um, the cheapest. Um, the locals all had to be persuaded of the benefits of this, and ev eventually they did come on board. Uh, and after the war, they were still requesting the British Army in occupation to come and uh, kerosene their wells, although a rather cynical medical officer did note that uh, he believed they had uh, come up with a method of extracting the free kerosene uh, from the water using gravity and a sponge, and that was perhaps their, their chief motivation um, for this. But no matter how hard they tried, the mosquitoes always got through. Uh, and so it was that many of these men, uh, many of these men contracted malaria. They might have caught it in the Jordan Valley, but they wouldn't display symptoms for quite some time afterwards. And it seems that Percy uh, was one of these men. Um, his horse transport company advanced as uh, we broke through the Turkish line in this great big surprise attack. Uh, the 4th Cav Cavalry Division were right over by the coast, uh, and they advanced uh, extremely rapidly. Uh, something like 40 miles in less than, uh, less than two days, or 50 miles in two days, uh, through the town of Megiddo, or Armageddon, as we know it, from which the battle takes its name. And they captured two extremely significant uh, Turkish towns, on, or Turkish-held towns, uh, on a railway that ran along behind the Turkish 
rear area, which was the main objective for this, um, for this offensive. Plodding along behind them came the men of the horse transport company. Uh, they arrived in one of these towns to find huge quantities of captured, um, of captured guns and material, uh, thousands and thousands of prisoners, all of whom needed to be you know, fed with rations that the, that the men in the horse transport company were carrying. Uh, and they had to collect all these guns and ship them off to central depots, so they were extremely busy. Um, they had hardly paused to, to draw breath. The uh, cavalry then advanced, pursuing the Turks, and they followed them all the way to Damascus. Um, linking up with the Arab irregulars under Prince Faisal, the Arab revolt, uh, people trying to uh, create a unified Arab state um, at that time, throw off the, the Ottoman rule. Uh, there are uh, allies in the desert, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, of course, uh, our fam one of our most famous liaison officers, um, who was uh, heavily involved in that. And the Arab irregulars, the 4th Cavalry Division, up, um, advanced up the railway um, north to Damascus, uh, while other cavalry units um, arrived. Um, from the east, uh, and they encircled the Damascus, and Damascus fell. The Arab irregulars were allowed to, uh, to enter the town at the head um, of the column, uh, and uh, a flag was raised for the, the newly proclaimed state of Hejaz um, in the town. They moved on from there. Uh, the offensive continued after a short pause. Um, it, was, uh, it made life a lot easier, um, capturing Damascus for the men of the horse transport company. Um, as they'd gone along, the further they got from the depot, obviously they couldn't keep ferrying backwards and forwards between the depot. And so lorries would drive up with carrying supplies and meet them in the desert, and they would then ferry these up to um, the cavalry that they were supporting. But with Damascus came a railhead, and, su and supplies of all kinds, things they hadn't seen for a, for a couple of weeks, fresh bread, and you know, meat, vegetables, no more emergency rations uh, to consume. So then they had to take up to the cavalry. Everyone advanced in, into Lebanon, uh, and as they crossed over the high ground into Lebanon, um, and uh, his unit uh, headed off to Baalbek, uh, it seemed that Percy headed the other way. He headed to the coast, Beirut, which had just fallen a few days um, earlier. By now, his symptoms from his malaria would have been obvious, and he was on his way uh, to hospital. He arrived in a hospital in the town uh, probably just a few days uh, before he passed away 100 years ago today from malaria. He was 28, uh, left a widow uh, and a young child who he never saw was born um, three months after he arrived uh, in Palestine. Uh, the second man, we uh, appropriately enough for someone who had quite a fiery character, I think, was born on the 5th of November, uh, 1898. Um, he was the son of an asylum attendant, a man who worked um, at Banstead Asylum, a former military man, and he was uh, a reservist still um, at this point. Uh, so an attendant would be a male nurse, and they had about 200 uh, nursing staff, male and female, employed at the, at the asylum, up to 2,500 patients there, uh, which used to stand by the uh, prisons, which are down. In 1917, he got a posting uh, to HMS Australia. Uh, Australia had fired some of the very first shots of the war um, in West Africa and he went out to join her in West Africa. He had something of a checkered disciplinary record. He went absent several times. Uh, he was up for insubordination several times, uh, and he spent a good deal of time in the cells, wherever he was, uh, and Australia was uh, no exception to that, and it wasn't very long before he was in trouble uh, and confined to cells. They spent their time stooging up and down the West African coast. Uh, they would escort convoys, uh, inspect shipping, hunt for commerce, raiders, um, they had a couple of refits during that time where Percy probably spent an awful lot of time sitting around doing nothing, getting very bored, finding ways to get himself into trouble. Um, at one point he, uh, in 1918, in the spring of 1918, um, he received a 60-day detention uh, centre for refusing to obey an, order, obey an order and he was sent home to the UK to serve that, um, serve that in Plymouth. He later returned. Uh, to rejoin uh, Australia uh, aboard the ship that would later be the first ship to carry Spanish flu um, to Africa. He kept his nose clean and actually surprisingly, despite his record, um, by the summer of 1918 he was considered to have very good um, character. Uh, but just very shortly after that assessment, um, he went absent. He'd uh, probably gone drinking in a bar um, in town, as he seemed to do, uh, and then not come back until he was fetched back by the military police and he was sentenced to 48 days detention. Um, they'd also decided uh, that they'd had enough of Percy, uh, and they were going to kick him out of the Navy. Um, so while he was serving, uh, serving a sentence ashore in Simonstown, uh, when Spanish flu 
uh, arrived. Uh, it hit the ships first. The ships had, uh, someone had brought that flu, Mantua, the ship he'd sailed on before, had brought that flu to a coaling station, Freetown. Uh, it infected the natives there, the 70,000 men that worked there, and then subsequently every ship that called in to coal there sailed away with not just coal, but Spanish flu um, as well. And so it was at some point, uh, Australia and all these other ships brought Spanish flu to South Africa, uh, where Percy was being uh, confined to barracks at the time. Um, it was a flu unlike anything we'd seen before, really. It was one that killed the young, the young and the fit, rather than the old and the, and the very young infants. And the reason it seems for this is that the young have the strongest immune system, and it's actually the immune system's reaction or overreaction um, to this flu uh, that killed them. The body killed itself trying to save um, itself. White blood cells uh, released proteins that uh, sent out like a distress call to release more white blood cells that sent out more distress calls that released more white blood cells. And eventually the heart just couldn't cope uh, with this anymore. Uh, they would have been unable to breathe properly. They had fluids filling their lungs. Pneumonia would have set in as a complication. Uh, and it was fatal in something between one in five and one in, 10, uh, one in 10 cases. Something like half a billion people were infected. Um, in 1918, and somewhere between 50 and 100 million died um, as a result of that. It spread rapidly through ships and camps, anywhere where men were gathered together. Uh, and so it was that uh, once the first case appeared aboard Australia, uh, the floodgates soon, very soon, um, opened. Uh, and there were soon being multiple funerals a day in the military cemeteries in Simon's Town, where Percy was. Someone must have brought it into detention quarters. Uh, and he caught, uh, he caught flu, was evacuated to hospital um, nearby, uh, and sadly died 100 years ago today, aged 19. It was before his discharge papers came through, however, and so he is entitled to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which at least is, is, is something, I suppose. Thank you. So let us pray. As we live our lives here in Banstead and its surrounds, relatively affluent and in the comparative peace, let's try and think how it was a hundred years ago. A village hoping to be on the brink of peace, having lost so many men during the war, and yet in the last few weeks of it, suffering many losses, leaving mothers, wives and children devastated. We can only commend the courage of them all and pray that such times never pass this way in the 21st century. We remember today Percy Blunt and Percy Perrin and all those men and women who have given their lives so that we might enjoy the relative peace of our country. Make your ways known upon earth, Lord God, your saving power among all peoples. Renew your church in holiness and help us to serve you with joy. Guide the leaders of all nations that justice may prevail throughout the world. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Make us instruments of your peace and let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. So as Jesus taught us, let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. <laughs> 
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.